Uh, quick introductions, my name is Louis Rothkopf, and I have the privilege of working with incredible developers at Millennial Media, which is the leading uh, audience platform in mobile. Uh, we're truly fortunate to have a fantastic trio of panelists here today to talk about data and the ways that their various companies uh, leverage it. So with that, I'll turn it over, starting to my left, uh, for some quick introductions. Hi, I'm Scott Prather from Playphone. Uh, I run our business development and uh, global carrier relations, as well as our developer relations. Hi, I'm Mark Balabanian. Uh, I'm with Turn. I run business development globally for Turn, and uh, what that means is that um, we partner with companies like uh, Millennial to uh, bring an ecosystem together for our clients. Our clients are agencies, um, uh, their trading desks, their brands that use our platform to consolidate their data and use that data for uh, programmatic media execution. And my name is Patrick Conley. I work at Reverb uh, on the marketing team, and I focus on user acquisition and retention. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, as an industry, we spend a heck of a lot of time talking about data and how we can make smarter decisions by leveraging it and being more data-driven. Um, I'd love to hear the panelists' thoughts on what data means to you uh, and how the recent influx of data over the last 12 to 18 months has changed the way that you do business. I'll start with Scott. Uh, I think data to, to us, to Playphone, is basically just saying, um, are we making the right decisions? Um, so as we uh, adjust our platform and adjust the features, um, we use data to back up kind of the, the gut instinct of, of, is this a feature that developers are going to use? Is this, developer, is this a feature that um, customers are going to use? Um, if it's not, is it because it's poorly placed? Is it not because it's um, poorly thought out or poorly executed? Um, and then use that to you know, generate heat maps, things of that nature, to say, um, why are people not using it? Um, or are they not using it efficiently? Um, if they're not using it efficiently, do we need to do a tutorial or something of that nature? Um, or if they're just not using it because it's not a good feature, then let's get rid of it and come up with something new. Mark? Um, so data in the advertising context is um, something that we've been working with for a long time. Our, our, our platform is multi-channel, so um, we were using data in display and video long before we entered into mobile. Um, the kind of data that we bring in is, is information that the advertiser is able to aggregate from their interactions with consumers. And then we also push out data um, that is generated by the campaigns that, that our, our clients run with us. Um, to answer your question, Lewis, about the influx of data, certainly within the mobile context, um, we've seen a lot more data becoming available that's useful to the advertiser. If you go back to 2011, when we first entered into mobile, I think a lot of uh, digital advertisers were disappointed by, by mobile, mobile programmatic specifically, because the data ecosystem wasn't really there to the extent of what they were experiencing in display, and so the comparisons were, were rather unfair. Um, over the last 18 months, we've seen a couple of, of important things happen on the data landscape. Uh, first and foremost, you've got um, identifiers that are, that are available for advertisers on the major platforms, Android and, and Apple. Uh, that's helping significantly with some of the issues that were experienced before with addressability uh, when we didn't have those identifiers. Uh, also, third-party data vendors have come into the marketplace, uh, and we can talk more about that um, later, but um, truly that's been a big, a big uh, assist. And then um, within the um, sort of attribution side of, of, of the landscape, there are a bunch of different vendors that offer the ability for for advertisers to gather information from their apps and, and use that to better understand how their campaigns are, are effective. So all of these things um, have really enhanced the data landscape and have helped uh, advertisers to uncover the value uh, that they're getting in mobile advertising. Pat. Um, I think data, as everyone mentioned, is very complementary to everything we do. Um, and from a, from a user acquisition standpoint especially, uh, the biggest change in the last 12 months is a really continued focus on trying to connect that data from where we're acquiring users to what they're doing in the app um, and then kind of what it takes to get them back into the app. So kind of continued focus on kind of bringing that 360 approach you know, across marketing and product um, to figure out ways to enhance user experience um, and then also make it more personalized, which I think it will continue to uh, be a big focus for us and across the industry, ways to use data um, to make that app a little more unique and make the experience more unique for each user. Got it. Uh, so just quick show of hands, how many folks in the room are developers by trade? 
Okay. And how many of you uh, currently leverage a data management platform, a DMP? Uh, okay. So at the risk of giving Mark the easiest softball ever, and uh, we'll, we'll keep this answer to 60 seconds, um, can you actually talk about what a DMP is, sort of more foundationally, uh, what, the, what developers might want to look for when they're looking at managing data, both first party and third party, and then as you start to think about activation, what are the benefits of harnessing that data through a DMP and then funneling it into a activating demand side platform layer, for instance? Sure, so um, to sort of oversimplify, so a data management platform is a piece of software that allows you to ingest data, manipulate it, segment it, do things with it uh, that you can use to uh, extract insights, um, and then also to take that data and syndicate it out. That's how advertisers are using it today uh, in our platform. So for a developer, uh, you know, you have an objective to increase uh, your audience, you want to prospect, you want to do retention, you want to call people back who may have left your site. With a DMP, you can actually capture and segment audiences in real time and then push that data out to a DSP, which we also have, or other type of take action system, um, and use that to uh, engage those audiences outside of your app environment. Yeah, and, and I want to ask Scott to pick up that point. So, so you know, once you've sort of segmented the audiences and you've identified uh, A versus B or uh, pink versus purple, um, what are you seeing smart developers that you work with um, doing with that, right? So now, now that they've, they've identified who those audiences are and what makes them different from one another, what do they do to harness that data to make better decisions or, or, or to make their advertising work better? Uh, I'd say A-B a tests to the point of being ridiculous. Um, I, I think the farther down you can segment your data, the, the more information you can glean from it. So um, knowing that one of your players might be a whale, um, that really tells you, okay, great, they're spending more than the average player. Um, but that doesn't really tell you what, what's the most they'll spend. Um, what's the most they'll spend over 24 hours? What's the most they'll spend over a week? Um, the more insight you can get from uh, your data, the better you can start to serve them. So um, serving them ads, if, if they um, spend a lot in one day but then don't spend again for a week, um, you know don't, don't bombard them with ads every day. But if they spend every 48 hours, uh, maybe update uh, your, your app with, uh, with ads or, or specific to them. Um, so I'd say... Uh, A-B test until uh, you, you can't do it anymore, um, and then do a little bit more. <laughs> so, 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 Pat, picking up on Scott's point, you know, thinking about it from the outbound marketing perspective, the user acquisition perspective, uh, what, where is that point of ridiculousness in, in A-B testing? I mean, are you doing you know, more like A-Z testing, or, or you know, do you sort of draw a line where you start to hit paralysis by analysis? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fun problem to have. Um, definitely something we get lost in on a daily basis. We haven't solved it yet. Um, but, but I think to, to your point, um, really we focus on what our goals are and then maybe even our sub goals um, and try and drive everything against that so that if we do get lost, it's, at least we're headed in the same direction. And you know, with these A-B tests um, that I think everyone is running you know, across product, across marketing, um, there is a way to keep the focus enough with those goals, and that's what we kind of try and come, kind of come back, try and come back to. Mm. Um, I think even within that sphere, you can still keep diving and keep keep diving. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, really keep the data as a complementary focus for you, and use as uh, other factors um, as indicators with the data to kind of push you in the right direction. Got it. And, and when, you're looking, when you're looking at data, and I, I really want to make sure that we are uh, sort of speaking the same language, um, when you look at data, do you look at things like first party learnings and signal? Are you looking at off the shelf data from third parties? Are you looking at fourth party data from, from advertisers? Like, what data has, which data has been the most useful for you? And then when you think about optimization, is it really your own or are you leveraging somebody else's? Yeah, I think for us, from a retention standpoint, we start with our own data and figure out how to keep users in the app and keep them doing more of this. Reverb is a, a reader app, so I want people to read more articles. How do I get them to read more articles? Then they'll spend more time in the app and you know, continue from there down that path. Um, and then from there, I kind of work away back. You know, 
um, what did the acquisition profile look like? You know, what are the users on, how are the users on Facebook different than the users on Twitter that, acquire, that we acquire? Um, from this platform to that platform. Um, and then from there, kind of moving from the second level to the, maybe the third or the fourth, um, what are those high level trends we're seeing across those and how can I find a better way to leverage those and use that as, as, as higher level learnings to kind of start in the right place and have a more optimized system um, as opposed to looking at it in the individual kind of pieces of the wheel. Got it. Uh, question for Scott. So, you know, you've, you've got this great viewport into games that are both premium uh, as well as free to play. Um, in your experience, looking at it through uh, the data lens, how are smart developers optimizing which experience the user sees, or how are you funneling users into the most applicable experience um, based upon what you've learned from them, based upon what Pat was talking about and, and what companies like Marks are able to do? Uh, so we use a lot of first-party data to um, try to put together kind of a recommendation engine based on um, not only the games that they're playing, also the games that their friends are playing, what time they're playing, stuff of that nature. Um, if we just see that people are primarily paying um, premium games that are action-based, um, we're going to start serving them more action games. Uh, if they're playing more sports games or their friends are playing sports games, um, logically it would make sense to serve them more sports games. Um, we try and use as much first-party data as we can um, for, that, for that very reason that um, the data you acquire through Facebook and all that, it's kind of nice as a subset, but um, we, we don't really like to rely on it as much as we do the first party stuff. Um, the first party data you're going to get is just, it's a lot more rich. Uh, um, you get a lot more information out of it. Mark, are you seeing the same thing? I mean, I think you, you know, not to put words in your mouth, I, I would suspect that you guys are probably agnostic when it comes to which data is used as long as it uh, flows through turn. Um, what are you seeing? Are you seeing similar bias towards first party learnings uh, to the exclusion of third party or, or is, it, is it different? Well, you know, our clients are primarily brand advertisers, so they have a variety of different objectives. First party um, meets some of their objectives and that it helps them with uh, retention and upsell uh, programs. But when they're looking to prospect, they're looking to find uh, people who are like their best customer, that's when they go out and use third party data. Um, and so our platform allows them to take their first party audiences, wherever they've acquired them, um, actually conduct lookalike analyses and select from a data marketplace, which we, which we have included in the platform of over 50 different uh, third party data vendors, find those, those vendors that can help in that prospecting objective. So um, it's, a, it's a combination and the two work really well together. Um, certainly in the mobile environment now, um, we're also uh, leveraging a lot of location data, um, and that's primarily coming from first party. Uh, uh, some of our clients are um, you know, trying to set perimeters around their store locations, um, and, and to some extent use third party data to conquest against the store locations of their competitors. So again, even in the location context, um, it's, a, it's a blend of both. Pat, you're a developer, uh, you guys have to make money, uh, and I'm sure that you have conversations every day around walking that tightrope between uh, purity of the user experience, which is uh, of paramount importance uh, to developers, and particularly game developers, uh, and keeping the lights on. Um, how are you balancing that tightrope? Are you using any sorts of, of data to make determinations around who sees what experience? I know Scott touched on that earlier, but you know, how do you how do you sort of fight or how do you give in to that natural tension between kind of editorial and and advertising? Yeah, I think the, the, our approach is kind of advertising at the right time, um, and yeah, definitely using data to figure out when's the right time to serve that ad, and um, if there's different ways to complement the experience without interfering with it. Um, is kind of the easiest place to start and obviously go from there in terms of um, what your goals and objectives are from an advertising standpoint and what kind of revenue you're trying to drive. Um, but it seems like a very um, f you know, good place to start without interfering too much into the, uh, the user experience. Yeah, I, I want to zoom in on that um, and you know, something that we're seeing a little bit uh, across the industry, and Scott, I'd love to get your perspective on this first, uh, is developers are beginning to identify with, with pretty incredible precision the moment at which uh, users are most likely to bounce out of the app. So it's after playing 13 levels or it's after following this tap stream or you know, whatever it happens to be. And so when you think about how precise you can get about the organic bounce point, it opens up all opportunities around exposing users to uh, monetization schemes that they otherwise would not be eligible for or might not be a great user experience. 
Are you seeing adoption of this? Are you seeing folks begin to identify those organic bounce points and then sort of leverage them to craft a experience based upon it? In other words, if we know the user is going to leave after 13 taps anyhow on tap number 12, let's show them that intrusive ad because they're going to leave anyway. We might as well monetize it on the way out. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing um, a lot of the kind of the bigger, more um, mature developers do that. Um, I think a lot of the, the smaller guys, um, that's, a, that's a level of detail that just, they just don't have the expertise in the data mining to do. Um, but yeah, actually, well, I've seen a lot of success um, kind of the opposite. Instead of um, at tap 13, you know, if they're dropping out at tap 13, tap 12, show them an ad. Um, at tap 10, let's give them something to keep them in the game. Mm. Um, if you find that people are dropping out at 13, at 10, let's, let's give them a reward saying, hey, thanks for playing. We really like having you here. Here's a power up to help keep you know, your next five levels um, be a little bit easier to kind of power through that spot. Uh, but once again, I think that goes back to, to knowing your data, knowing your customer, um, and also knowing your game. If, it, if it, the level of difficulty ramps up at level 10, um, you have to know at level nine, it can't be a cakewalk. Um, you have to kind of ease them into it. Got it. And, and Pat, what are what are you are you are you leveraging any of that sort of uh, tap stream data? Yeah, I think echoing the same thing. Um, as opposed, to, we we look at the 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 kind of the bounce event very often, but then um, kind of as Scott says, working our way back um, to the few events before to figure out a ways to enhance them or improve them um, to kind of put your focus there from a, a retention standpoint. So uh, changing the, the direction just a little bit, uh, Mark, I think you and I are similar in that we, we both started off in display, did a tour of duty and video, and, and now we find ourselves in the mobile world, which uh, is very different. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on um, how mobile has been different from the demand side and, and the data management perspective. Um, and as folks are entering mobile every day, as new companies are sprouting up every day, um, what, what should they be doing differently in how they approach outbound marketing and user acquisition in mobile versus what they did on the desktop side or console or, or even broadcast? Yeah, you're right. Um, we have both been through some transitions uh, in, in our careers, haven't we, the similar ones. And, um, you know, finding ourselves in mobile now after having spent some time in display, I think a lot of times the industry gets together to talk about these things and there's, there's always a kind of a, a bit of a hangover uh, effect of, well, you know, we tried to use cookies, we tried to use banner ads in mobile, and boy, it just wasn't as effective as it is in display. And um, I think that that's happened because initially, quite frankly, uh, the buy center wasn't really that creative in their approach to mobile. Um, you know, we didn't, in our platforms, and we didn't, uh, in our advertisements, really look for the unique value of mobile and try to um, uh, align our campaigns to that. That has definitely changed. Mm. Um, and so some of the things that advertisers are, doing, advertisers are doing with mobile through our platform and others is really taking advantage of real-time location uh, in their campaigns. Um, real-time location is one of the very unique aspects of mobile. And uh, for example, we have uh, automotive clients that have been uh, using tactics uh, to target uh, consumers when they are on the on those brands lots. So if a consumer is showing, but not actually in, driving, not right? actually driving. Okay, no. Good. no, at least uh, we hope not. I hope they're not looking at their phone while they're driving. Yeah, perish uh, the thought. But um, but so they're they're using their own their own store locations to try to uh, reach people while they're on the on the the showroom floor. But then also they're conquesting against uh, their competitors' locations using that location of the, of the actual um, dealership as a signal of, of intent. So um, uh, we're definitely seeing that, and not just in automotive, but other verticals being uh, one of the unique aspects of mobile that's being utilized. Also, uh, many of our clients, uh, especially our CPG clients, are experimenting with uh, downloadable coupons that can be redeemed on the phone itself. So um, that's another unique aspect of mobile. And then, um, so, so many of our clients are brands. Uh, they're also doing video advertising. And, and what we've seen is that digital video on a mobile device actually tends to perform better. It has higher completion rates uh, because the users are more engaged. The share of voice on the screen is, is greater than on the desktop. So I think you know, over the past year, year and a half, as, as more brand advertisers have experimented with mobile, they discovered these unique characteristics, these u unique aspects, and are spending more uh, in mobile. So I want to pause uh, for a moment uh, and see if we have any questions from the audience. We'll have a, a chance at the end uh, as well. 
Uh, but wanted to see if anybody has any questions they're dying to ask our three panelists at this point. All right, think of them. Um, so Mark, you know, you, 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 you talk a lot about uh, how brand advertisers are uh, approaching mobile and, and, and sort of what they're doing to harness location, for instance. Do you see them approaching iOS and Android differently? And I'd love to get uh, Scott and Pat's thoughts on that as well. You, you know, I, the, um, the operating systems are uh, definitely data that is being used to segment audiences. I don't, don't equivocate. How, how, how are they using those distinctions to make marketing decisions? I mean, are, are they showing different uh, brands, different experiences? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, they're using it uh, to say as, as a segmentation for demographics, frankly, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a signal of uh, you know, different types of audiences or preferring uh, one uh, operating system over another. And so we definitely see optimization being um, uh, enabled for um, Android phones that are quite different than what we're seeing on the Apple. Scott? Uh, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's, it's uh, a terrible thing to say, but it seems like um, the iOS audience, definitely it, they're looking to spend a little bit more aggressively. Mm. Um, it seems like the Android, you have to kind of uh, give them a little bit more of a push. Um, and then, of course, you get into stuff like um, like iBeacons and stuff like that, where it seems like uh, the people that want to adopt uh, kind of an Apple strategy are more first to market um, versus the Android are a little bit more cautious. Pat? Yeah, I think the same thing. And, and in addition, I think it's you even see it from different Apple devices when you're you know, looking for users on the iPad versus hmm. um, on the iPhone and then to Android. So the same learnings apply. And as, as Mark and Scott said, figuring out a way to just segment to different audiences and kind of take uh, a same strategy approach but kind of look um, to tailor that to the different audiences, and you know, especially with Android, we have different size um, phone screens, and you know, can play with ads a little differently. That's fun too. A little more flexibility, but a very similar approach. Is is the sort of uh, fragmentation on the Android hardware side a, a, a pro or a con or both? When you look at it through the lens of acquiring uh, new users, um, I think first from a developer perspective, it's a challenge. Mm. A good challenge to have, uh, but a challenge, and you know, larger screens are, um, can create a better experience and also a, you know, problematic if you figure out where to scale um, your game or your app back to the smaller screens. Um, from an acquisition standpoint, um, I, think there's a, there is a, I think there's a little more freedom um, on the Android platform than the iOS platform. Um, but that also makes it a bigger challenge for marketers. You know? sure. It's not as cut and dry. You know, um, Apple's pretty clear about what you can do and what you can't do. Um, so you know, that's a good thing and a bad thing. And um, figure out where to spend your time and you know, where, where are users worth more to you? Is it in the Apple device or an Android device or is it the same? So kind of figure that out and, and go from there. Scott, one of the things that uh, having access to rich data lets Playphone do is create these customized experiences um, for developers and, uh, and consumers alike. You know, when you look at crafting these unique one-to-one -one experiences, specifically what kinds of data are, are the most useful? Is it the things we talked about, like the, IO, the, the OS, uh, the location? Uh, is it something that's completely unintuitive? Like, wh where do you draw the most value? Uh, for us, it's gameplay. Um, I mean, mm. if, if somebody's going in and, and downloading a game and they play it for five minutes and get rid of it, um, that's not nearly as interesting to me as somebody who keeps a game for a month and they play um, two days on, two days off, and they play for 45-minute sessions. Um, because we can extrapolate a lot of data based on that, saying, you know, um, we know when they're playing most often, we know the session times, so we can kind of make a guess when they're going to play next. Um, that, that's far more interesting to me than... than um, and somebody who just deletes it, you know, after playing for five minutes. Um, so we can use that data um, to start, like I said, recommending games to them. Um, if they're playing one game for 45 minutes, the other one for two, you can make a pretty solid guess that they might like that one better than the other. Pat, one of the things um, I love about what you guys do is uh, the connection you have to social. Uh, you know, tying the individual back to their broader social graph uh, is obviously keying in on a lot of not only trends, but consumer behaviors that we've seen time and again to be uh, very rewarding and, and, and fruitful. Um, to what extent does the social graph uh, play a role in how you craft experiences? Yeah, I mean, I think, so it's actually part of our app. So we think about it from kind of a marketing and a product perspective. Um, so one thing that's great about social is 
part of everyone's life. So you kind of have an equalizing factor there, or, or most people. Um, and then also it's extremely cluttered. So when we think about a product perspective, is ways to make that less cl cluttered and ways for you to enjoy your social experience faster and easier. Um, and then from a, a more of an acquisition standpoint, um, you know, trying to figure out what people are interested in um, and using data to, to tell that story and then target them based on those interests and personalize kind of the, um, the ad or the acquisition experience uh, around what they want. Um, and it's really great because there's so much information there. Probably the biggest problem or the biggest challenge is that information is constantly changing. You know, the World Cup was great two weeks ago. It's not great right now. Mm. So I can't, you know, create a message around that and expect users to really um, jump onto that. Um, so you really have to be super nimble from that approach. But I think you can kind of um, deep dive more into, uh, you know, the exact, you know, um, vertical or interest or, you know, topic that people want from there. Where do you draw the line, right? So, so you can harness the social graph, you can learn a lot about a user, you can speak to them in their language, literally and figuratively, um, but you hit that uncanny valley, right, at some point where the app knows too much about me. Um, have you ever run into that moment? Have you ever sort of come close to touching the stove uh, and, and having that happen? Uh, or how do you define how to avoid hitting that point? Yeah, privacy is always concerned and will always be a balance and probably the, the best balance over the next 12 to 18 months, I think. Um, we try and look at high level trends and keep it kind of more broad as to what topics you're interested in as opposed to you read an article about this um, to try and not kind of get that in your face from an engagement or advertising standpoint. But like I might be interested in sports, so let's message you around sports and keep it at that level hmm. and kind of go from there. And then maybe one level down, you know, like I'm interested in this sports team. Um, but, but try and kind of keep it in that middle range, not getting too precise and too exact um, to kind of, you know, freak you out. So keeping in mind that 95% of statistics are made up on the spot, I have a question about uh, some numbers that I saw recently um, in an article. Uh, online casual and social gaming takes 39% of all hours spent uh, in gaming overall in the U.S. and 29% of the money. Um, those numbers are comparable in Asia, Europe, uh, and emerging markets except for the money in Europe, which is considerably lower uh, at 16%. Um, any thoughts as to why that is, panel, and uh, any notion of whether better using data uh, would increase that percentage to be more comparable with the rest of the world? Uh, we found in emerging markets, um, we kind of dove into the, the data a little bit and then kind of backed up and looked at it from a, a bigger perspective. Um, in emerging markets, what we've discovered is um, uh, games on your mobile are very cheap and long-lasting um, entertainment. Um, so a lot of these places, you're not, you can't go down to the um, the cinema and watch a movie. A lot of people don't have television at home. Um, they don't even have a home computer. Their their mobile is their internet connection, um, and for free, they can download a game that they can play for 70 or 80 hours. Um, that's pretty good, cheap entertainment. Uh, I think when you start getting into the to the UK and and, and Europe. Um, there's just, you're, you're fighting for their, their attention hmm. um, with so much. I mean, go to uh, Times Square in New York and, and try and get somebody's attention, listen to, have them, ask them to listen to a 30-minute story. There's just it's too much stimulation. It's, it's just visual overload. Um, I think when you start looking at uh, um, Europe and, and the U.K. versus emerging markets, um, there's a lot less money, but there's a lot more people, and they're a lot more engaged. So, you know, something that uh, always sort of startles me a little bit when I get off the plane in, in London is you're bombarded with advertising across all media for real money gambling. Uh, and I wonder, I'd love to get your thoughts, to what extent the easy and uh, very common availability of real money gambling um, in the UK and in parts of, of Western Europe um, is responsible for that delta uh, between dollars spent on non-real money casual gaming. That's a big question. How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, I, I would say I think if, if we were able to categorize that and actually include that, I think probably the numbers would be the same. Um, what we've discovered in the, the limited amount that we've looked into it is real money gambling. Um, the ARPU is significantly higher. Um, if you don't know, ARPU is average revenue per user. Um, so people that are playing for money, they actually keep playing for money. It's kind of like going to a casino. If you lose your first 100, you're going to keep playing thinking you can get your 100 back um, versus if you lose... 100 virtual chips, who cares? They don't really have, you come back tomorrow and you probably get a fill up of those chips. 
Um, so my, my guess is if you kind of normalize that data across um, real money and, and virtual money, my guess is they'd probably be fairly similar. Uh, so question, uh, question really for Pat and Scott and, and Mark, love to get your sense from the advertiser perspective as well. So, you know, thinking about how we interact with our devices, PCs, consoles, even tablets, I think to a large extent, are shared among members of the household, um, shared among uh, maybe even friends. Um, no one shares their phone, right? It's the most personal device we own. You know, keeping that in mind, how are developers like you and, and, and your developer, Scott and, and Mark, how are advertising, or how are advertisers uh, leveraging that one-to-one -one consumer level uh, targetability, uh, conversation ability on the mobile device, different from how they are uh, on any other platform uh, through the lens of the gaming context in particular? Um, so I think we've seen a shift in the in the market around this too. In the last you know twelve months, um, the continued prominence of these engagement marketing companies that are very focused around this and taking a first step. Um, I think that'll continue to evolve with with personalization of the of the phone. Um, from looking at those trends to figure out what users want and how we can give it to them um, is going to be a really fun experiment over the next twelve months. Um, you know, to figure out what times they're actually using their phones and what they want to be served in the morning versus the afternoon. Um, you know, what apps they're using in the morning versus, you know, before they go to bed. Um, it, hopefully, uh, markers can find a way to enhance that experience. I think that's a really exciting opportunity that we haven't seen on, you know, PCs and, um, you know, a, a little more tablets. Uh, but where someone's kind of always connected, um, you have an immense opportunity to, to, to find the right message for the right time. Um, which will be more testing and more data, so um, that'll be a, uh, a a new marketing problem to have. Nice, Scott. Do you have a uh, I was going to say that it kind of raises. I mean, it's kind of a little bit off topic, but it's interesting to see um, kind of the idea of what marketing can do with that, and then uh, kind of balance that against the idea of, of user privacy. Um, so I had an Android phone, and I had an email, you know, said I'm going to go on a trip. Um, I didn't put it into any sort of calendar or anything of that nature, and the morning of, Google now popped up and said, hey, your flight is an hour delayed, there's traffic. Um, and I kind of said, whoa, that's, that's going too far. Um, so it's interesting to, to see where, um, to me, that was, that was going too far, that they were scanning my email and putting that in as a convenience. But, but we're not normal, right? So, so you know, oh, completely being, agree. being in the space, we, we, we sort of know how this stuff works, and we've, we've been to the sausage factory, and, and you know, it, it is what it is. Do you think consumers would have that sort of same visceral reaction to, because, you know, I, I've gotten the same notification, and I think at first maybe, maybe I'll say, oh, well, that's kind of interesting, and I'll say, I'm glad they told me, because now I'll leave early. I, it, you know, what, what, what do you think? Isn't that kind of an ignorance is bliss idea? Perhaps. Um, I, I think it's, um, I think for me and you, that line is very different than the average consumer. Um, if my mother saw that, she'd be terrified and convinced that the FBI is spying on her. <laughs> um, like I said, I, I think um, for marketing, what's going to be important and for marketers is figuring out, um, like I said, how we segment that audience to deliver that information in different ways. Um, so for me and you, it's not a big deal because we know, okay, they just scanned my email, no big deal. Um, for my mom, it might pop up and say, um, hey, there, there might be traffic. Instead of going you know, that one layer deeper and saying, hey, you have a flight coming up in two hours. So Mark, I, I, I know your answer on this one. Um, so I'm gonna start with, uh, with, 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 with Scott and Pat. Um, so a trend that uh, I think everybody in this room has probably heard talked about uh, to death today and, and certainly in the years leading up to today is, is the rise of programmatic. Um, and I think mobile is very different from video and display in that uh, it took video and display uh, quite a bit of time for mediation to catch up with uh, the state of the art, whereas mobile really grew up with mediation. Um, but programmatic is still pretty new, uh, even for mobile. How has the how and 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 has the rise of programmatic uh, impacted the way that you do business on both the monetization side and the outbound UA side? I think from the uh, the outbound UA side, it's really fun. It just creates more opportunity for testing. Um, getting a campaign live now isn't you know talking to a website, talking to their sales rep, um, you know going through the process, figuring out your targeting. You know, once you have your higher level goals and understanding of what you want to target, you, you set the camp, you work with, you know, a few people, set the campaign live, you're good to go. You, you tweak it over the few weeks, but you don't have one person fully committed to that campaign. They can kind of move in and out, which is great. Um, so I think it, um, you know, you can get, you can get stuck in that, in that, that data suck, stuck um, because 
Um, there's so many different avenues to test. Um, but I think it's really fun from a marketing perspective to, to you know, like, I want to acquire a new user this week. Okay, I'm ready to go in a few days. Scott, similar, similar thoughts? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I completely agree. And then um, what's more interesting is, is when you start retargeting. Um, so getting the, the data that you receive from um, uh, the, the campaign and then using that your first party data to really dive deeper and kind of um, make those users more useful. Um, and then from there, like I said, you just can kind of build on that and start to target. Um, if, if consumer type A is really kind of where you're making your bread and butter, um, next time you go to do a campaign, you just target them um, and kind of rinse and repeat. Mark, I'll, I'll, I'll slightly tweak the question uh, for you, and, and I'm going to pick on you because you're, you're sort of the, the vendor on the panel. Um, everybody who has spent time in this space or has even glanced at the, the Lumiscape can tell you it is unbelievably cluttered uh, with vendors uh, in between the dollar and the user. Um, without sort of picking any company in particular, where do the inefficiencies lie from your perspective, right? So, so you've got this great 30,000 foot view of, of how dollars are spent and how data is transacted. Where are the friction points that just don't need to be there versus where are the kinds of companies in the ecosystem that are really adding value? So there's still a lot of uh, silos of data, right? And that's, I think, what's unfortunate for the publisher and the advertisers that there's so many different intermediaries that are not just taking a chunk of the transaction, but also taking a chunk of the data out of circulation. Um, you know, there are still ad networks today, and especially in mobile, that you know, specialize in maybe one or two tactics, whether it's retargeting or location targeting or some sort of fancy creative unit. Um, and they're adding some value there, but the, the reality is that consumers don't operate in those silos, right? They're using their phone, um, and they're also using their tablet and their laptop. And um, so consolidation of all of that data is what's valuable to the marketer. And when that data isn't consolidated and the marketer isn't able to leverage it, then that creates waste. And that means less money for the publishers. Um, the inefficiencies come from transactional friction, which you were talking about earlier, having to work with you know, multiple different uh, vendors. The inefficiencies come from operational overhead, just trying to pull all the reporting together and see what happened. And, and the inefficiencies come from attribution. Right? When you're looking at a performance across a bunch of different uh, media sources, it's really hard to tell which ones are, are contributing. So with all of those inefficiencies, obviously, um, you know, we've got a point of view, which is that consolidating the data, um, consolidating the channels, bringing all of that together is the best uh, result for not only the advertiser, but also for the publisher to squeeze out those inefficiencies. The other thing that we're doing is we're partnering with, with you guys and we're partnering with other um, you know, best in class uh, vendors in the landscape to create really a unified ecosystem that's part of the platform. So uh, that also makes it a lot easier for an advertiser to not only get value from our technology, but from the best of the landscape. Because we're not going to build everything, you're not going to build everything. Um, but actually integrating the things together that complement each other um, also reduces a lot of that inefficiency. So I, there's definitely more to come. Um, but. Um, it's, uh, it's a good problem to have uh, that we can create more value um, for both sides of the ecosystem. Pat, if, if this were the mobile marketing Hollywood squares, right there in the center square would be native. Um, what does native mean to you? Uh, is it real? Is it a fad? Uh, are you selling native? Are you buying native? What, what's, what's, what's the deal with native? Yeah. I actually, I love the idea of native advertising. Um, when I think about what it should be, it should be personalized content recommendations. What it is, is articles about cats and Kim Kardashian. So <laughs> we need to get rid of that and find a way to... We need to get rid of Kim Kardashian well, or no, articles no, no. about... Just a native, Got just it. a native advertising. Both, um, both actually. You know. Um, but ways to actually tailor you know, what you've been reading um, and what you might like, I think that's a really fun um, marketing solution for users. Um, I don't think we've gotten there yet. Um, I think there's a way to use data to do that much, much better, better and that's how I see the solution. Um, and if we can do that, I think it's something that's going to be here to stay. You know, right now, it seems to be a, a, a good source of, of revenue for publishers and a great um, new advertising spot. 
um, that feels very uh, linked to the page, it's just finding a better way to link that content to the page. So um, that'll be a, a great next step to, to, to see. And I think that does change that than it is here to stay. Scott, uh, if I were new to mobile, uh, if I were a developer, I were launching a game uh, tomorrow, and I could afford to do only one thing, in addition, of course, to going to mmedia.com, where you can begin to acquire users and monetize your app overnight, mmedia.com, what would be the one thing uh, that you would tell me to do? The, the one thing, uh, run, <laughs> uh, I would say. Why, why is that? Is it, is it, is it, is it a clutter? It, it, are the challenges facing new game developers uh, different than they were uh, 20 years ago and two years ago, or is it just sort of more of the same? Uh, I think, I think uh, five years ago, there was little to no information. And a lot of it was um, you learn as you went. Um, and now it almost seems like there's an overabundance of information, so much so that it's confusing to a new developer. Um, if you came in and had no idea what you're doing, you walked into Casual Connect, you'd see 800 companies um, all kind of roughly doing the same thing. Um, kind of the, the line between mobile marketing, user acquisition, um, that's kind of started to blend a little bit. Um, and that might be just as you were saying, kind of as the, um, the technology start to integrate. Um, uh, I think that's a good thing. Uh, the bad sign, the bad thing is, is it's so complex. Um, so I would say, uh, answer to your question is, is I'd really plan out kind of soup to nuts what my app is going to look like, what it's going to do. If you're going to use um, user acquisition, if you're going to use mobile marketing, if you're going to use um, you know banner ads or anything of that nature, um, figure that out way in advance and and plan accordingly, as opposed to trying to shoehorn the stuff in at the end. So we've got five minutes left. Uh, I have one final question for the panelists, but I want to open it up once more to any audience questions uh, before we do. Sir. What was the most surprising thing that you found um, from, from running uh, an AB or multivariate or some other kind of experiment? I would say how many variables you run into. I mean, you kind of, when you kind of go and you expect users to kind of go one way or the other, and every once in a while you'll get one person that you know, just does something that's just kind of way out in left field. Um, I'd love to be able to kind of reach out to them and say, what, what the hell were you thinking? Um, unfortunately, it's not possible, but um, when you scale that up to, you know, millions and millions of users, uh, it becomes pattern, and, and, and that is even more curious to me. So I, I would say um, what's most surprising to me is, is uh, how uh, inconsistent humans are, I guess, in playing games. Um, Oh, I guess the question was like more concretely, what, what have you seen that's been counterintuitive or surprising about people behaving in a, in a certain way in response to a test, is it, if anything? Is there uh, I think probably for me, one of the examples is people, how often they'll watch um, video ads and they'll watch tons of them. Um, especially when we, when we went to emerging markets, uh, we, we had a, a developer that instead of paying for 99 cents to unlock the full version, um, or you know, full uh, uh, power up or whatever. Um, you could watch two video ads, um, but they didn't put a cap on it. Um, so this person literally sat there and watched. It was something like 17 hours worth of ads at 30 seconds at a time, um, and it, it boggled my mind that this person would sit there watching these ads over and. I mean, somebody got paid off of it, obviously, but um, it, it shocked me. So once again, I think not knowing what people are going to do is always surprising. Okay, 15-second uh, lightning round, uh, starting with Pat. What is your one unintuitive prediction for how, uh, when we all reconvene here 12 months from now, the landscape will have changed? I'm hoping in 12 months we'll see a bit of a data consolidation where we can get more data easier. You know, all these kind of niche companies will be playing either nicer in the sandbox or there'll be some uh, submersion acquisitions to make it easier for everyone to find the data um, and then use it. Mark? Well, I think similarly, there's going to be uh, a, an explosion of data that's going to be monetizable in the ecosystem. I think that um, you know we're on the verge of this data economy really opening up, um, and that's going to be very powerful for advertisers. Uh, we're going to not just see audience data, location data, but potentially the ability to bring data forward that will allow for better understanding of user behavior across devices. And um, hopefully that turns into more revenue for uh, game developers. Scott? Uh, I hope less cats and less Kim Kardashian. <laughs> uh, but I would say, yeah, consolidation. I think of the industry of, of technology, I think everything is going to become more streamlined. Please join me in thanking our panel. You were terrific.